It's January 2022, and this is Core Talk, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm your host, Andy, bringing you the latest people, programs, and projects of the Norfolk District. So this is our third year on the air, folks, and for the majority of this show's history, we've been bobbing and weaving through many, many changes. We've had to be flexible and learn, sometimes even relearn, how to operate and still deliver the mission. And that's the theme for the first episode of season three, Agile and Educated, which is what the Department of the Army, the country, the Commonwealth of Virginia, the community we serve, and our partners need from us. Our first segment reviews the latest info related to COVID measures, which was recorded late January. So by the time this episode drops, we'll probably have been updated. Followed by segment two, which is an education on the life and work of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., which was coordinated by our Equal Employment Opportunity Office and our Mission Support Division here. And really, it's unlike anything most of us have ever heard before um, related to Dr. King. I strongly recommend, if you can, watch it on our YouTube channel uh, because we loaded the entire presentation that was given by Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, who is the Norfolk State University Professor of History, College of Liberal Arts Dean, and director of Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for African Diaspora Studies. Now, a side note, segment two starts at about 35 minutes um, into the episode. If you're, So if you are pulling it up on YouTube to watch, just skip to that 35-minute mark. So without further ado, let's play segment one, People of the Norfolk District, featuring two of our executive staff members, Matt Ferguson, the Mission Support Division Chief, and Tom Emmerich, our District Counsel, Uh, who are offering their COVID cliff notes for all of our employees. Looking back on 2021, now this was the year we thought things were going to all get back to normal, Um, but we came to realize that we were so far from what whatever normal is. And and many of us thought COVID would be a thing of the past, folks are gonna come back to the uh, work on site, but as we know that that didn't happen. And while that was going on, I know I was one of them. It felt like we were kind of waiting and waiting for the next instruction to move forward. And and sometimes we got it, sometimes we didn't. Sometimes it was like, oh, well, the instruction is there is no instruction. So that being said, the two of you are two of uh, many folks in the district who are critical in helping keep our folks informed. So uh, Matt, Tom, again, welcome to Core, Th- Core Talk, and thanks for being on with us today. So I'm going to start kind of with the review. So Matt, I'm going to I'm going to start with you. Review of 2021. Just give me an overview of, of some of the challenges that the workforce faced in 2021 regarding the COVID measures and the district. Yes, uh, great question. And you could almost word it with like, what wasn't a challenge dealing with COVID in 2021? Um, And I think you can kind of break it out in a couple different categories. New teammates, like, how do I onboard a new teammate virtually? And um, particularly someone that's new to the the federal workforce. And now I've got to onboard them, got to make sure they get their training. They're not seeing anybody face to face. Um, And we can work through that. But you know, the difficult part then becomes with the, the workforce climate and the command climate, how do you instill that on a new teammate when they, they can't just walk to the cubicle next to them and ask someone how this is going or they don't necessarily get the interaction with, with other employees through all the different divisions in the district. So that's been a tough one because most companies and the government's the same way, you generally lose new employees in the first 90 days to a year because they they don't acclimatize and they don't feel like they're part of the team and they don't understand the climate. So that's been really difficult. Um, if you kind of jump to like the current workforce from there, well, now we've gone from, you know, everyone in the office and same thing, being able to talk to people, being able to meet in person to working virtually. And now I'm going to work virtually and I may have to homeschool my kids at the same time. Um, and and how do I find this work-life balance that we that we preach? So we've done some things like expanding work hours, and we've got the core hours and allowing employees a much more flexible work schedule. But that that helps them in their 
interaction with children and family and, and some other things, but it also sometimes creates that tension of I'm always on the clock, right? Because now, yes, yes. now I'm, I'm allowed to have a little bit of flexibility. So, oh, if I get email at one in the morning, I've got to answer it at one in the morning. Or, you know, I, the only time I can I can get this meeting going is during my lunch break or at eight o'clock at night. So it can create a lot of stress and boils down to like, how do you balance that? How do you know when you're on and when you're not on and when it's okay to not answer a call or an email um, and making sure that we're not overworking people, which we've seen quite a bit. So that's been a tough one as well. And then if you look the same way with supervisors, um, supervisor, according to their PD, 25% of their time should be spent developing employees. Most of us know it's it's way more than 25% of the time, which is already a challenge. How do I do that when I don't necessarily see them? Um, and you can still have calls and you can talk to people and you can work through how their how their works on how their productivity, but you lose a lot of those intangibles, right? Um, because I don't see you and I don't interact with you every day. So it's much tougher to, to pick up on that. So I, I think as you kind of let off, it, it's really... Like you cannot over communicate in this environment and you've got to remain flexible. You've got to be agile. And we as leaders have got to keep providing tools, education and whatever training we can learn um, either through other federal or, or other corporate agencies that are dealing with the same thing with how do we give our team the tools they need to be successful. Oh, well, I was gonna, I was gonna totally cut you off. And and before I ask you, Tom, your question, I, I have to tell you guys, I was so excited because I'm streaming <laughs> a show last night, a Zoom commercial comes on and they say, you know, they are addressing the hybrid environment. And it was the first commercial I had seen where it's like talking about some of your folks are coming back and some of your folks are, you know, working from home and that is the thing now. <laughs> All right, so that was my little tangent. So. So Tom, we're talking about that same topic. Now, what was the Office of Counsel seeing in 2021? And, and what, what were some of your challenges? Well, we, we certainly faced some of the challenges Matt just discussed. Uh, one, I think one of the biggest challenges we had was uh, with the interpretation of all the different guidance and requirements coming from, you know, really from the uh, president, president on down. Uh, you know, so in a lot of the guidance, it was coming in from different directions. We had Department of Army guidance. We had uh, headquarters USACE guidance, uh, DOD guidance, uh, executive <clears throat> orders to in interpret. And often, you know, even once we interpret it, there would be changes, you know, maybe the next day or a couple of days after. Uh, so the, it was certainly challenging. And also, as Matt said, and, and you, you, you've you mentioned communicating all that information in a clear and concise way to the workforce, uh, you know, is a challenge and remains a, a challenge. Uh, I, I can give one exam example, you know, with the vaccine mandate, uh, the exemption process that originally came out uh, is much different than it is now. Uh, and that's just one example, you know, that that happened quite frequently over the over 2021 and understandably so, because, you know, the pandemic is complex. The uh, pandemic environment is constantly changing. And, you know, so are so people rethink things and and, and things change. So that, that's to be expected. But the challenge with that is trying to keep up with the changes, keep the workforce informed and making sure we're complying with all the the policy and, and, and direction from from above. Uh, you know, another challenge, I think, quite honestly, you know, we, we got a lot of questions from employees asking about things like, you know, the new telework policy, uh, the vaccine mandate. Uh, there's a lot of privacy issues that have cropped up recently. Uh, you know, for example, you know, supervisors asking folks if they're uh, their vaccination status, uh, you know, once we have that information, what to do with it. Yeah, it's, um, I didn't even think about the privacy issues. I immediately go to like, oh yeah, telework was a challenge. The vaccination mandate was a challenge, but a lot of that seems to be based on like the timeline when information comes down. So it seems like information come down really, really quick and change. And then there could be nothing that changes. So let's, let's take that deeper dive into what goes on behind the scenes, because I think employees are, are really curious about that. 
So let's, um, and anybody, either one of you can go first. Let's explain what goes on before employees get that, that update email from the commander telling them what measures are being enforced at that time. Can I, I jump on that one first? Matt? Yeah. If you don't mind. So I think uh, Colonel Hallberg is really great at communicating and want, wanting to be transparent with the, the workforce. So, you know, we frequently have conversations, uh, uh, Colonel Hallberg with, you know, Matt and I or, or the rest of the executive staff about how do we get this information out there quickly and transparently. Even if we don't have a complete picture, uh, you know, we might only have a few pieces. Uh, so, but but he still wants to get the 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 information out there. And sometimes it's a result of maybe an employee asked him a question, uh, and then he thinks, well, if this employee has this question, you know, maybe other employees have this question as well. So, you know, typically what we do is, uh, you know, have a discussion uh, with uh, Colonel Hallberg. Uh, Matt and I and maybe a few others will have a subsequent discussion and figure out how do we craft a message uh, to get out to the, the, the workforce. And typically it, it is done via via email, uh, but uh, you know also during town halls or, or, or other avenues as well, we, we, we try to get the, the message out there. Yeah, I, I think Tom hit it really well. And you know, one of the challenges I think we've had to deal with and why it takes us a little bit longer. I think sometimes an employees would like to see it is we're going to get an order from Department of Defense or headquarters Department of the Army. Um, and they're great at writing orders for uniform military personnel. It, it may or may not line up exactly with how the civilians need to be treated or, or how we can relay that information and make sure that we're following all the guidelines for civilians versus uniform personnel. So there's there's a period where we're going to ask questions back to hire with like, how can we do it like this? How does this apply to us? What do we need to pull out? Um, and then we want to make sure we're in line with NAD and USACE guidance. Like we don't want to put guidance out off a of headquarters order only to change it three days later because USACE published something completely different. So in this information age, as we said, everyone can see an order as soon as it's published, but we want to make sure we're not jumping in front of guidance from higher headquarters before we push it out. Um, and I think the other challenge, and, and Tom has been really good with this, and, and even you and Mark and PAO have helped out quite a bit, is if you ever read these orders, they're pretty long and confusing. <laughs> and, and when you're at frag of 15 or 17, going through there and figuring out what's changed and what hasn't, I mean, it's a full-time job. So pulling out what's important to our team, what changed and what do we need to tell them, so that it's a concise or as concise as possible message. And we're not, we want to over communicate, but we don't want to just drop piles and piles of information on someone that they don't have time to read. Everybody's busy. Um, so the shorter and more concise we can provide updates and, and the way ahead um, it is a challenge in itself, but I think we've done as well of a job as, as we can of making sure we get out what the team needs to know to keep moving forward. And a lot of times the answer may be, we don't know. We, we don't know any more than the employee does sometimes, but just making sure they understand that and that, hey, we, we know your concerns, we're asking questions, we're gonna get you the answers, but it might not come as quickly as you want. Because um, we don't wanna have a perception like, we've got all this information in the exec staff and we're hoarding it and we're not gonna tell anybody. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, that, that perception can be out there and perceptions become reality. So just understanding that we want to provide everyone the information as quickly as possible, but we want to make sure they have the right information and it's concise. So essentially, this is like COVID cliff notes. And can we use that phrase? Because yeah, that's just Yes, okay. I love it. COVID cliff notes. <laughs> that might be in the next commander's email. <laughs> I guess like where I get confused is so like who are the agencies that are um, – offering this information and this instruction. So we've got like Department of the Army, we've got USACE, we've got NAD. You're dealing with the union. Like how many entities are you guys uh, compare notes with or get your information from and make sure everything jives in order, in order to have some kind of regulation or um, something that we can be implementing at the district level? You know, from, from my seat in the Office of Counsel, uh, we have really good relationships with the vertical chain, NAD and headquarters USACE. And, you know, when things come down, you know, we have 
you know, we have conversations about what this means, what other districts are, 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 are doing. And, and that's very, very helpful. You know, sometimes the answer, even at the headquarters USACE level, you know, there's, they still might be waiting on guidance from the Department of Army. So, you know, some things, you know, we're just on a pause for, but that's good to know, right? Like if, yeah. if it's a pause, we, you know, we don't want to get out in front of, you know, the, the, the agency on, 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 on doing something, for example, uh, exemptions or uh, enforcement actions, you know, that sort of thing. So there needs to be consistency and we, we all need to be going in the, the same direction. You know, outside of DOD, I, there's a, uh, the Safe Federal Workplace Task Force, which was put together by the White House to implement all these uh, different changes or requirements with the, the vaccine mm -hmm. mandate. That's actually a great source of information. And it's a great source of information for, for anyone who wants to learn more about the, the vaccine mandate and you know things the federal workplace is doing to make things safer. Uh, they have a good uh, FAQ section and, and they have a, all the different uh, executive level guidance uh, at that website. So we'll, um, you know, Tom, we'll take that and we'll get that from you or we'll, we'll look it up and I'll make sure that goes in the show notes. So we have that as well as the CDC um, site available for folks to to take a look at. Yeah, Andy, you just beat me. I was going to say, we don't necessarily get guidance straight from the CDC, but they put out some great information and they'll tell you the updates and the changes if you look at their website. And what we've started to notice is if you read the CDC website, when they change it, you can expect the headquarters department of the Army frago about a day or two later so it, it's a way to kind of look forward and say hey this might be coming and let's let's see how we can use it so another great website and i know colonel hallberg shared that with the team but i highly encourage everyone to spend two minutes every couple of days and take a look at the changes yeah or even follow them on twitter uh you know they're, they're putting out that if you want that little nugget and just a very short amount of characters there you go now, Matt, I wanted to ask you, now you have an interesting position, whereas you're dealing with the the union, correct? Yes. When, okay, so let's talk about that relationship. I'm not going to assume that it's difficult. I don't want to make any assumptions, but there's probably some challenges there with that. Um, yeah, I, I, and I don't think it's challenges. And I want to start off by, and this is not just a plug, we have a great relationship with our union. Obviously, we have a collective bargaining agreement, and we want to make sure we follow that. But, you know, if it's information and it's out there, we want to share it with everyone as quick as possible. But then, and Tom's super helpful with this as well, is if, if this is creating some type of change in workplace environment or change in, like we talk time and attendance, that's something definitely we share with the unions and give them a chance to review it before we implement it. So that's another thing that can sometimes cause a delay, but that's a delay for the right reasons, right? We want our union to be able to review these documents, provide us any feedback before we, we implement it. Um, I, I think with regard to the union, it's critical to get their, their, their input for an ex executive order, things we're, you know, we're going to need to implement. Their input is still valuable, you know, because we're going to do it, but, you know, how do we do it? So it's important to get their, their input on that. You know, it's also kind of the same mindset. Uh, you know, we've done numerous uh, employee surveys asking about telework and telework environment. How do people like it? What are the challenges? And, you know, that sort of thing. And, and that information, you know, it's just it, 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 it's useful because we use that information and then we that helps form different policies like the, the new telework policy. Mm -hmm. So as we said earlier, we're, we're still in this, right? We're still working through things. And th let's assume that we're going to be working through things for, you know, some time in the future. Uh, let's go over some of the current measures that we have in place now. Now, Matt, for folks going into the building, uh, what do they need to know? What you need to know if you go into the facility is we are doing everything possible to keep it as safe a workplace as we can. We are creating a safe environment as possible. Um, and I think what you need to know, and it's not necessarily building related, is like work with your supervisor, be flexible, and let's figure out the right in-office virtual balance um, for you. And that's gonna be different for every single person. And we still have a mission that we have to meet. Sometimes that's gonna require to be in the building. Sometimes you don't have to be in the building, but when you are in the facility, we are sanitizing multiple times a day. We've upgraded the HVAC system. Um, we're wiping things down. We've got masks, we've got gloves. 
we're in the process now of upgrading some of the conference rooms to make them a little more user friendly in that hybrid environment. And the really, if you forget everything I just said, if you come into the building and you don't feel safe or you want something sanitized or you need something, you can talk to me, you can talk to Chuck Copeland, you can talk to Ben Porter, and they will get you what you need. Um, we, have, we have not denied any type of request for anything that's going to keep someone safe in the workplace. So a, a shameless shout out yet again for our ULA folks. Uh, I think every episode, every episode, somebody from logistics is <laughs> like, just I, like uh, uh, so yeah, Chuck Copeland, you've got Ben Porter, you've got Eric Silva, you've got all these guys who, um, that, that as small of a team as they are, I know you're, you're going to see them in the building and they, they do, they, you, you, you know, they're prioritizing, keeping everybody safe, um, keeping that feeling of safety and, and making sure everybody's staying, staying healthy as well with their measures. Um, so what about visitors? What are we dealing with now with that situation? I think what I would say, and I think what the colonel's echoed, it's come down from Colonel Lloyd, the chief of staff of USACE as well, is like, if you can do something virtually, try to do it virtually. But we understand there are times when you're going to have to meet in person. Just, you know, maintain social distancing, make sure everyone's wearing a mask. Uh, if we need to sanitize rooms or set rooms up for you, we can. There are some guidelines that are currently on hold with how we'll have to screen those visitors, but we're still kind of, as we said, waiting further guidance on that. Uh, there is Department of Our Army guidance that requires visitors to attest that they've been vaccinated. And if they are not vaccinated, they have to show proof of a negative uh, COVID test. That is the policy that is on pause right now, not as a result of the injunction, but as a result of we're waiting on further guidance from, from above. <laughs> the, okay. the other piece of it is Department of Army guidance that unvaccinated employees would need to get tested before they enter a federal facility. That is also on hold. Again, not the result of the injunction, but waiting on guidance from, from above. I know it's frustrating maybe for employees when, when I, I say that and, and we don't have an answer when it will happen. Trust me, we're equally frustrated. We, we want to know as well. And when we know, we'll, we'll be the first to tell you. So. And I know now as it stands, is it, is the, you have to come in at least two or one day per pay period, or is that also subject to the supervisor um, it, to their discretion? Two days per pay period with the influx of, Omicron, uh, supervisors have plenty of flexibility to address particular situations. Maybe a sick kid's at home, maybe the, a school's gone virtual for a week, you know, those type of situations. So a supervisor, first line supervisor has plenty of discretion to to meet those those situations. Okay. Yeah, and, and we probably can't say this enough and I hope I didn't just cut you off, Tom, but like if you're sick or think you're sick, or don't feel well, don't come in the building. The colonel, I believe, sends that out on, on a weekly basis. But if it's your designated day and like, oh, I've got to be in the building today, and you wake up with a fever, a sore throat, you're coughing, and you can't smell or taste or, you know, whatever the latest symptoms are, like, don't come in the building. Like, we're going to err on the side of caution for you and for all the teammates. So let your supervisor know. As Tom said, we're flexible. We'll work with you. The last thing we want to do is bring someone in and have some type of super spreader event in the building that we could have prevented. Yeah, and it's also like no one wants to be that person who like coughs or sneezes in public. You know, like when you're at the grocery store, you're like, I got it, and you try to hold back a cough, and it's just like, and then you want to feel like you got to be like, I swear to God, I just have allergies. <laughs> no, because no one wants to be that guy either. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll have you'll have 300 sets of eyes on you if you cough in, in front of anybody right now. So. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, so I saved. Um, I say the best topic for last for you, Tom. Um, we touched on this proof of vaccination. Um, okay, so we're, I want to go over it just a little bit more in depth because it touches on a lot of a lot of items that I I feel like are are, are probably newer for uh, our civilian for the DoD civilian workforce. And and tell us what what we were looking at in 2021 versus what we're looking at now in January of 22. With regard to vaccination status? The vaccination status, okay. yes. So, yeah, so the it really kicked off with the executive order 
uh, requiring federal employees to be vaccinated. There were multiple executive orders, uh, some applying to a contractor vaccination. There were uh, there was an executive order about uh, private sector OSHA regulations. So those are all different ones. But the one I'm talking about is the executive order requiring federal employees to be vaccinated. So that came out. Uh, give me one second. I have it pulled up. It was on September 9th, 2021. The executive order came out. So as soon as that came out, my first thought was like, oh, boy, we're going to have a lot of questions and how are we going to implement this? And and. I still have a lot, a lot of the same questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, subsequent to the executive order, the White House stood up the Safer Federal Workplace Task Force, which I, I just discussed. Uh, and then we started getting uh, guidance from Department or uh, DO, Department of Defense and Department of Army and uh, USA's headquarters on uh, on things about how to implement it. So the, you know, the, with regard to vaccination status, the supervisors were provided guidance on how to ask about it and uh, obtain proof. And it was done through, it, it, I don't want to be boring and talk about forms, but it was form 30, DOD form uh, 3175, where the employee will attest to it, show a vaccination card to their supervisor. Uh, the supervisor completes their part of the form and boom, you're done, assuming you're, you're vaccinated. Uh, if you're not vaccinated, uh, or if you if you claimed an exemption, like a religious or medical exemption, you could do that, you know, say you're not vaccinated, but I have an exemption request in, and that would just kind of pause any potential adverse action against that person while those exemptions are, are, are going through the, uh, the process. But that's, really how the organization confirms that someone is vaccinated or not. And that information is is limited to just a small group of people in the, uh, the supervisory chain. Like, for example, if you wanted to know if someone who worked for, for Matt is vaccinated, uh, you, no, you, you don't need to know it and you can't know that. So supervisors need to maintain the uh, privacy of that, that individual. This is a lot in the supervisors. I mean, this is like, this is like, and I think you mentioned before, so I work in this environment that no, I don't think anybody was really trained for. Like, how do you, you know, props to the supervisory folks, man, that makes me happy that I'm not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> minus the paycheck. Um, so Matt, anything to add to that, that you're dealing with on that, that end with the, uh, do we all yeah, just email I think Matt Ferguson when we have a question? Just yeah, and you know what, like, I know you said that as a joke, but please do. Like, I think a lot of employees, as you said, are frustrated when they don't know all the information, they're not getting all their questions answered. So please use those. Like, don't sit there and beat your head against the wall because you don't know something. Ask a question. I'm happy if you send it to me. I may not know the answer, but if I don't, I'll either find someone who does or or we'll reply like, great question. You know, we're going to ask the same thing. And as soon as we know, we'll, we'll let you know, because we don't want anyone to think they're ignored or we're holding back from, from telling them information. Um, I think Tom did a great job of explaining the, uh, the vaccination kind of process and, and where we're at. And should we get into testing? We think we have a plan to do that, that protects everyone's um, personal information and is respectful and, and dignified so that it's, it's not, being thrown out there for everyone to see. Um, but more to follow on all that. And, you know, as Tom said, we're awaiting guidance. And when we get that guidance, we will we will share it with everyone. But don't be scared to ask a question. We all are happy to assist everywhere we can so that, that our team at least feels updated with the latest information that we have. It, it might not be what they want to hear, but we'll, we'll share it with them. I, and just to follow up real quick on that, Matt, I, I think, you know, Colonel Hallberg, every time he sends out a message or talks to the the, the team, he talks about safety is of the workforce is the number one priority. And he, he usually follows up with about treating everyone with dignity and, and respect. So a lot of people have different views on vaccines, the mandate, COVID itself, how, you know, how big of an issue it is. You know, we all have our, our own views, but, you know, the key that he gets across is even if you disagree with another person, you know, everyone needs to be treated respectfully. 
And, you know, we can we can disagree with each other, but that doesn't mean we can't be friends and it doesn't mean we have to to be uh, unprofessional and, and, and disruptive. For sure, for sure. I, I mean, that, that brings me into uh, another question. You know, Colonel Hallberg also, you know, says as Army civilians, uh, we are a diverse and agile force. So what can that force, what can our employees do or should know for us to remain diverse and agile when we're getting you know, frustrated as the rules change or don't change, or we feel like the info is slow to reach us. What are, uh, what's the call to action here for us? But this is a new environment and we're all learning together. Um, so we are not experts just because of the position we sit in. We, we don't necessarily know any more than anyone else when it comes with how we're going to move forward and what's the best thing to do. Communicate, share ideas. If you have a challenge, push that challenge up and let's, try to get the right people to address it or get you the equipment, um, the workspace and the training that you need to be successful. Matt, those are great points. And I, I would just say, and I think this addresses your question, Andy, is the new telework policy. So we learned a lot of lessons learned from our workforce posture going through the pandemic. And we're still learning them because we're still going through it. But at the end of the day, most people enjoy the flexibility of working virtually and having the more flexible hours. People enjoy that. So even post pandemic, uh, the new telework policy captures some of the best of the lessons learned of where we are now with working virtually. So you know, moving forward, there's still going to be uh, significant virtual work being done by our, our employees. So I think that's something as an organization that will make us more attractive for people wanting to work for the Norfolk district. You know, that's going to be implemented, you know, <laughs> you know, we've pushed it back multiple times already, but it's, you know, we're aiming to implement it now at the end of February, you know, we'll have to evaluate again in a, in a couple of weeks to see if, if we will. That's yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Andy, sir. Oh, no, I'm just saying that, that, you know, that's good to know that we're not just trying to get through it, that you guys are there trying to figure out, okay, we, we want to actually come up better from this experience, not just get through it. Because you can just get through things, right? Like you can slog along and just be like, all right, now it's done. Now we're all going to go fight. Taking the experience, it, that's such a that's such an Army Corps thing to do. Like, let's improve on this. This is, you know, so not to be dorky, but, you know, it kind of is. All right, go ahead, Matt, before I dork out even more. Oh, no. I was just going to say, I, I think one of the great things with, and, and Tom was instrumental in the, the new policy and Colonel Holberg as well, but one of the things we really want to do is like, just because the Colonel signs it doesn't mean it's etched in stone for the next 10 years, right? This is something we will periodically review when we learn how it's affecting the workforce or are there better ways to do things and we can make those adjustments. So it's it's not something that it cannot be changed. And I think you started off with agile and flexible, and that's what we are trying to do. Excellent. So um, before I let you guys go, is there anything that is just weighing on your show or you want folks to know, or I mean, even some shout outs, folks that have helped you guys do your job and, and, and have been uh, instrumental in, in helping the workforce, um, right. feel free. I'm really proud of uh, and everyone. I think every the whole district has done well with this pandemic challenge and working virtually. But I really want to give a shout out to the my teammates in the office of, of council. I, I think they've, you know, it's it's a really outstanding team of professionals. Uh, I've had I really can't say I've had any challenges with them working virtually and getting the job done. I never think, oh, are they working or not working? I I, I trust them implicitly and they, they do a great job they produce and you know i get good feedback from the rest of the organization about them and i know we're not alone in that i know uh, other divisions feel the, the same way about their folks i do i do think our folks are eager, eager to have some more interaction in the office which we will and we have uh over the past couple of months but you know I've, i'm really proud of the the team yeah there are rumblings of a bench press competition uh, 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 <laughs> is that, is that <laughs> I'm just saying, I heard. I, I'm not putting any names there, fellas, but. We do bench press. I, I will say the Office of Council is the current cornhole champions as well. So we're, I think, three uh -huh. years in the running. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be able to challenge you on cornhole, but I would like to enter this bench press competition if, if it ever happens. Um, <laughs> and, and I will say, when you asked that question, Andy, I was actually going to say the Office of Council. Like, they have been super responsible or responsive and like it's a really difficult job navigating through these orders and figuring out what applies to us and what doesn't and then 
making sure that we're putting the right information out. And, and Tom and his team have, have been awesome. Um, whenever we ask or I ask or the Colonel asks for something, they, you know, they get it back to us extremely quickly. And um, when I look at what some of the other districts across USACE are doing, I think we're leaning forward as much or more than most of them. Um, and that's that's because of, of people like Tom and his team. So Thanks, not man. just tooting his horn because he's on the call. And then obviously I've got to throw a, a shout out to our, our safety and logistics team because they're in this mix as well and making sure we're doing what's right to keep our employees safe and, and providing the equipment that I hope we all need to to continue working in this environment. And not to be super hokey, but you really got to give a shout out to all the employees because things change and they change fairly often and they are working through it. And, you know, you can you can have a debate on productivity slipping or not slipping or whatever. But to my knowledge, we are meeting our timelines across the district and and accomplishing, you know, our goals and our missions, even when we change every couple of weeks, how we have to conduct business. So. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed, I will say this, um, I've, I've actually enjoyed uh, communicating via these video platforms because you get to see people's dogs. <laughs> I'm like, there's the puppy. So it's like a little a little happy uh, uh, for me. So that's a, but yes, okay, before I go off on, on a puppy tangent, I want to thank you guys again for coming, explaining this to us. You guys are really kicking butt and doing a lot for us. So we appreciate it. Rolling into segment two, Anna Myers and Sharika Wanamaker put together a special emphasis program event for January, and Colonel Hauberg, our district commander, was able to weigh in on the special emphasis program. Um, it's a pretty cool intro because he takes an interesting approach to our employees' participation in these events. Check out his intro and then roll right into uh, the presentation itself. Again, if you can watch this on YouTube, we highly recommend it. So what do you see as, um, what, what is the special emphasis program and, and, and what is what is EO doing when they put these events together? I really see it as a continuing education for us all uh, that we continue to, to learn, you know, each month on an underrepresented group within the workforce. Then, then we can understand that specific group and their viewpoints, and then we can incorporate it in how we operate and how we communicate with each other. And in the end, I think it really helps, you know, our workplace behaviors because we understand each other a little bit more. We, we talk about no one has enough time, right? We're always, everybody's busy. Everybody's, we all feel overworked and underpaid and, you know. Um, so so to, to ask folks to take an hour out of the day, that's a big chunk of time sometimes. You know, why invest time in special emphasis events? It's be, First of all, if we're committed to pe people first, then uh, we really need to capitalize on these ideas of inclusion. And, you know, for us to capitalize on inclusion, we really need to understand different viewpoints. Then we can better integrate everyone's perspective into, you know, just workplace behavior or it's working with our, our non-federal sponsors or uh, whoever benefits from the projects. And then it, by doing that, it enables everyone to achieve their full potential. We're going to learn about Dr. Martin Luther King from a different lens. Um, we, we know we know from our history lessons, but Dr. Nubi Alexander is going to she's going to give us a different lens to better understand. And I think that that's yeah. the key. completely, completely agree. Um, we're really lucky to have her. Um, that was that was a great. I know Sharika Wanamaker made a, uh, had to make a couple calls, ask, you know, uh, cash in a couple favors to have her um, come and talk with us today. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, in this COVID environment, it really goes to show how important the special emphasis program is to, to USACE and to the Norfolk District in that we're overcoming some challenges here by, by having these, uh, figuring out ways we can still have those programs take place and remain safe and healthy. So talk to me a little bit about that. What are some of the things we're doing to make sure that, you know, we're still getting this education out to our, uh, our folks? To be honest, this may be a better platform or a means to uh, ensure that we're educating our folks um, uh, because we're not constrained to just having in-person 
uh, in the multi-purpose room. We're able to reach everyone throughout the district and all the field offices. Um, and of course, you know, there's added benefit of it's in a safe manner. Um, but we have it there. It's recorded. Uh, anyone can uh, can watch it in the in the safety of their home um, at any time, right? So uh, it's it's not just a one one shot and done. Um, it, it's there for for everyone to view it, it, at their convenience. And I, I will, I, you know, I, I always I, I do want to give you know the Norfolk District especially props because through the, these waves of COVID, we have figured out. <laughs> how to keep the conversations going and how to keep people engaged. And, you know, even last minute, you know, if there is some kind of tech issue, we just, we figure it out. So, um, we've, you know, we've got a good team for that. And that definitely, I think, it, in my opinion, when we talk about resiliency, you know, being able to roll with the punches and, and use the word agile. I think that's part of it, you know, having folks who are agile enough to seek that kind of education and seek um, these programs, even if it's a little bit different. So um, so do you think uh, we've been we've been agile? Do you see a, an agile workforce <laughs> rolling with I punches? Think, <laughs> I think we have been very agile, um, you know, whether it's you know participation in, in these events. And again, I think that um, in the telework environment, and being able to do things virtually, it does provide flexibilities. And But we've been agile in participation for this event, whether it's a weather event and everybody just being agile, being safe at home, you know, not having to come through, you know, through the ice and snow. We're still be able to deliver on the mission. And uh, look, uh, and I've said this, you know, several times, we're better together. We are. We are better together face to face. There's just more social activity uh, discussions that go on. You have a better understanding that you don't necessarily have in this virtual environment because there aren't the sidebar conversations, there aren't the hey, you know how are you how are you doing? But we're good. We are good whenever you know we're apart and we're in the telework environment. We're always going to be better when we can be face to face. Um, Since I've been with the Corps of Engineers, I've only been with the Norfolk District, but it that's kind of embedded in. This is this is part of who we are. We take that time each month. We we try to be the best us that we isn't that what you asked of us? Be the best you yeah, that you be can the best be. This, you can be the best you. You be the best you. And I mean be this kind you. of falls in line each month. You have an opportunity. We have an opportunity. We're given this this gift of being able to you know learn more, open our mind up to be the best we that we can be. Um and you know, thankful and grateful to Dr. Newby Alexander, um, again, Dean of Liberal Arts and History Professor at Norfolk State University, as well as Director of Joseph Jake and Roberts Center for African Diaspora Studies. I, I studied saying diaspora about 15 <laughs> times before we started recording. Is there any last words you want to say to, you know, our, our Norfolk District folks or to uh, Dr. Alexander or Newby Alexander? I just want to thank Dr. Newby Alexander for her time. And her effort, her energy, giving us this great presentation, this great gift, as as you said, to help us understand from a you know a different lens, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, because I, I think it makes us all better. Um, I'm really um, excited about talking um, about Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, someone who is talked about quite a bit, especially of late, but is misquoted and his ideas convoluted. Um, and so I want to really kind of really give you a little bit of a history lesson without it being a boring history lesson, because this is an individual who really represents some of the best 
of our ideals and really encapsulates the ideals of America. It is something that he was very passionate about. So as a nation, we talk about truth and justice. Uh, we talk about equity. We talk about freedom for all. And those are the things that he really embodied in both his, his ethical perspective of the world and of American society, as well as his personal uh, ethical belief systems. Next slide, please. So I wanted to, to really start off with two things that frame my discussion today. Uh, and the first one was written by historian Jenny McCartney, uh, in which she said, without history, we have only ignorance, which I think is so important for us to understand. Next slide. And another um, quote that's very near and dear to my heart was written by Carter G. Woodson, who was the primary founder of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And for those of you who may not know, that association now, um, well, the acronym is ASALA, um, is based at Howard University. That organization is the one that creates the Black History Month themes every single year. And so Carter G. Woodson, who is an early African-American historian, said, if a race has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition. It becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world, and it stands in danger of being exterminated. And I believe that that idea is even more important today as we see all of the, the I would say, the misstatements about critical race theory, uh, the misstatements about bringing up and incorporating African-American history into our understanding of the broader story of American history, and of course the danger of minimizing that history because it makes some people feel uncomfortable. I remind all of my students and everyone I talk to when I talk about history, that history takes no prisoners. History is as it is. We don't have a choice to decide what aspect of history we're going to talk about and what aspect we're going to leave out. If we do not include the total picture and all the various perspectives, then somehow the story is mangled, is convoluted, and of course, at the end of the day, is inaccurate. And so I'm just going to give you today a little slice of the history of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. so that you have perhaps a better perspective of why we celebrate his legacy, why he's important for us to remember the total picture, not just those pieces that make us feel comfortable. Next slide. And so what is the real legacy of Martin Luther King Jr.? Next slide. Well, you know, when we think about Dr. King, we have to incorporate him very much into the modern civil rights movement. Now, I do want to say that a lot of people have no idea that the civil rights movement did not begin in 1955. That's the modern civil rights movement. The civil rights movement actually began in the 18th century. Uh, right at the end of the American Revolution. And so we would see an ongoing effort by people of African descent to gain civil rights that were denied them by not only the colonies and the states, but by the early federal government under the Articles of Confederation and then the U.S. Constitution that was ratified in 1789. And there was an ongoing effort to regain the rights or to at least position people of African descent in a place where they would have the same rights as the white citizens of this country. So Martin Luther King Jr. was right in the middle of what we call the modern civil rights movement. Of course, historians are going to have to change that particular statement because many people thought 
that after 1965's Voting Rights Act, that the civil rights efforts were no longer needed. Of course, we're now in a new century and there are still ongoing and lingering effects of what was put in place in some cases almost 400 years ago. And so Martin Luther King was firmly a part of the civil rights effort. And interestingly, he was not initially a willing participant when he was pulled into this, he was a young uh, pastor of a small church uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, and he was um, very much a moderate. He was hoping to live uh, the rest of his life like his father uh, in a very comfortable environment, uh, well away from the national focus and far removed from any political uh, entanglements. And so his decision to be a part of that is also an important part of this story. I also want to, to, to say that just as in the 1950s and 60s, we had tremendous reaction um, to the civil rights movement. In fact, it's always amazing to me how many people who were very much against the civil rights movement uh, 40 years later, uh, talk as if they were an active member and supporter of the movement. Uh, people, that's why, you know, when historians read uh, memoirs and autobiographies, this is usually when people try to clean up what they were doing uh, many, many years later. So you always have to, to look at those memoirs and, 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 consider that you have to read it with a big old grain of salt because these are people trying to rework their images. For Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, he was someone who decided because it was presented to him to be a part of something that would embroil him in what in the 1960s and now in tw in the in 2020s we're calling these culture wars next slide and with the culture wars is usually a segment of the population that is kind of creating a backlash to those culture wars. So before I get into that, I, I wanna remind us of some of the things that Dr. King said. It wasn't the I have a dream speech that, had, that really catapulted him um, to more of a national audience, but it was all the other things that he said that were even more important. He would say things such as in the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies but the silence of our friends. And so in that quote, he was talking to moderates, moderate whites who did not speak out when they had the opportunity. And he encapsulated those ideas in his letter from a Birmingham jail that he later expanded into a book. Another quote, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And what most people forget is that those ideas actually came from the American Revolution. Next slide. Another quote, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And these are the ideas that he believed in. It came from his religious upbringing, from his religious training. It also came from his advocacy of many of the same ideas that were part of Mahatma Gandhi's ideas, that you cannot return hate for hate. You must return love to hate. So when someone hates you, you cannot respond with hate because that will only generate more hate. And that is perhaps one of the most difficult principles of most religions that have those particular ideas. Turn the other cheek, in other words. One quote that is so relevant, and it is often quoted, is that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And this idea really embodied the civil rights movement, it embodied the ideas that, that really um, drove that movement forward 
and his words help to help help to really propel um, many of those ideas and the songs, of course that came out of the movement. Songs that in some cases were parts of spirituals or were church songs became of course advocacy songs that really represented an advocacy for civil rights and justice. And it was hopeful, it, hopefully it was to motivate other people to press on and to understand that even though they personally may not have been affected by these laws or these policies, if they existed in society, everyone was harmed by it. Next slide, please. And then two more quotes. Dr. King said, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance or conscientious stupidity. And as, a, as an educator, I can tell you that is exactly what educators believe, that if you want to remain ignorant of something or you are consciously trying not to know, these are two of the most dangerous things. The most important thing you can do is learn because learning really spurs growth. And that means growth spurs understanding. And though without that, you cannot have a society that works well with each other. And then finally, he said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And of course, that is really part of, and that, that quote is really where the theme of Black History Month comes out of, and this idea of acting um, and, and doing something, not just sitting back and relaxing as we are celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but also acting, becoming part of the solution. Next slide, please. So one of the things that many people don't realize is that Dr. Martin Luther King did not have the entire civil rights movement on his shoulders. He was part of a long legacy of action and activity that went on, as I said, all the way back to the latter part of the 18th century. But even at the beginning of the 20th century, you had organizations like the Niagara Movement. You had the NAACP, the Urban League, uh, the Legal Defense Fund that um, was part of, originally part of the NAACP, the National Council of Negro Women, the National Association of Colored Women, and many, many other organizations. And he worked with some of these organizations, especially the National Council of Negro Women, the Urban League, the NAACP, and then an organization that he helped to found, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, to help galvanize people from all aspects of society and culture. The Congress on Racial Equality was another organization to help move this forward because this effort was a gargantuan effort. It was about changing the culture and the policies of American society, because this inequality was baked in from very early on and continued to be a, an accepted part of our society and culture. Next slide. So how did he emerge? Well, I've given you a little bit of information about him. I said it was in 1955 when the Montgomery bus boycott began. And for those of you who may, who may not know, Rosa Parks, uh, who was the secretary of the NAACP and trained in nonviolent resistance, was someone who decided and, and agreed to be the test case to eliminate the discriminatory busing policies that were there in Montgomery, Alabama. And what were some of those discriminatory policies? Well, African-Americans had to go to the front of the bus and pay for their ticket, then get off the bus and go to the back and embark on the bus there. 
And sometimes the drivers thought it was pretty funny to take off and keep on going rather than allow the people to re-embark on the bus. These were some of the indignities. Another indignity was that if the white section uh, of the bus was full and a white person had to sit in the black section, every black person in the black section had to get out of their seats and move even further to the back of the bus and stand up. And so these were the policies they were against. And what were they asking for? They were asking to not be forced to do that. And so Rosa Parks didn't just go on the bus and sit down in the white section. She was actually in the black section of the bus. But what she refused to do was to get up and stand when a white man had, was forced to sit in the black section. She refused and she was arrested for that. What they needed in Montgomery, Alabama, the black community that was fighting this particular policy is they needed a, a young person who was not caught up in the politics of the city. So someone who was newly arrived um, to, to really be that voice for them so that it appeared to be not only an unbiased voice without uh, any, any involvement in the local politics, but also someone who's charismatic, someone who was young, who was energetic, who had the enthusiasm and the passion to, to make this thing a reality and to motivate people because they knew it would be a long fight. They didn't know how long. They didn't know it would be about a year, but it would be a long, arduous fight. Next slide. And so Martin Luther King Jr. reluctantly, initially, reluctantly accepted this. He he really um, uh, built his efforts on his um, training uh, and his background in the Southern Baptist tradition, uh, his training um, uh, in philosophy, his ideas. He pulled on the ideas, as I said earlier, of Mahatma Gandhi. Um, and he knew that this would be a struggle. He just didn't know how long of a struggle it would be. And the city of Montgomery did all kinds of horrible things. They passed laws that said that if two or more people were walking down the street, that that was illegal. And they, of course, were targeting Black people who were walking to work instead of riding a bus. Um, they they would not allow, allow more than two people in a vehicle at a time, otherwise they would be arrested. Um, there were all, all kinds of ways they were trying to force the black community to utilize the bus. What they found out with this long boycott was that the bus company almost went bankrupt because blacks were resilient and refused to comply with those policies. And rather than see the, the bus company completely tanked, they caved in and allowed um, not just for a shift in that very discriminatory policy, but they also uh, allowed uh, a whole change in the policy. They removed the segregation and discriminatory laws that were put in place and blacks were then allowed to sit wherever they wanted on the bus without any kind of recriminations. Next slide, please. And so Dr. King found himself in this position, but he saw that it didn't just happen or this wasn't a problem just in Montgomery, Alabama, but this was a problem in a lot of other places. And so he, he, along with Ralph Abernathy and other pastors, decided to start a national organization among the ministries, uh, not just in, in the Baptist group, but also in Methodist, Episcopal, uh, the Pentecostal, and other organizations within the, church, the Christian church. Um, uh, the Southern Leader Christian Leadership Conference, and they pulled all these people together to help work out a national strategy so that they could uplift the people in their communities as well as motivate and galvanize their power to bring down these discriminatory policies that they believed were also um, really anti-Christian ideas and policies. But 
because they knew violence would be a part of this. They needed to arm the people with a response that was a trained response, so a nonviolent trained response. And this was perhaps one of the most challenging things to do, because when someone is screaming and yelling and trying to hit you or whatever, how do you protect yourself without becoming violent? Next slide. And so Dr. King um, was, was very, very firm about his commitment to nonviolence and continued to be very firm until the day he died. Now, one of the first things the SCLC did was they realized that you cannot demand your rights if you cannot vote. And so voting was such an important aspect of not only the um, civil rights movement, the work of the NAACP, but also all these other organizations. And in late 1957, there was a civil rights bill that um, was pushed. Um, it, it finally uh, went through to some degree. It began to, I guess, move that needle forward a bit. And this was under uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, um, this idea of not just um, making sure that the armed forces were desegregated, but also um, uh, an, an act by the federal government to begin to peel away at the discriminatory policies when it came to public accommodations, when it came to employment, housing. But then, of course, we know that there were many, many issues. There were other laws in place that um, perpetuated a lot of this discrimination, such as um, the federal law that provided for the construction of suburban communities only if they're white communities. So the federal law actually uh, restricted uh, the development of suburban communities for white communities only. Um, but the 1957 Civil Rights Act was at least moving in the direction um, to assist with these efforts to equalize society. Um, and so Dr. King um, understood that this had to be uh, a real uh, effort, regional effort. And by regional, I mean throughout the South. So, <clears throat> excuse me, anything below the Mason-Dixon line. So from, from Maryland all the way uh, across uh, to the Mississippi River and even into East Texas, that those areas where there was a where the majority of African Americans were still living, and where a lot of obvious discriminatory laws were in place. Um, Dr. King was a product of the South, and he perceived the world in these early years from the perspective of an African American Southerner. Um, but of course, there were a lot of issues that he would later see beginning in the 1960s that existed in the North that were just as discriminatory. It was just not as obvious um, in, in not only not as obvious in the laws, um, but not as obvious in the practices. You had to peel back a few layers to really see these discriminatory practices. Next slide, please. Now, the thing that would precede the March on Washington um, was the Birmingham incident. And of course, Birmingham, for a lot of people, came to be known as Bombingham because there were so many attacks against Black churches and African Americans, especially those in leadership positions, that in uh, most of the black newspapers throughout the country, they call Birmingham, Bombingham. And Birmingham was a huge city that was growing, that had a lot of industry and so forth, but it was also caught in, um, in this culture of repressiveness against African-Americans. And so it would be in 1963 that we would kind of see 
um, the, the, we think of the civil rights movement as something in which there was something going on every single day. And, and that really didn't happen until about 1961 when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was founded by Ella Jo Baker, who was born in Norfolk. And this is a woman who really believed that um, college students could play a major role in helping to move the civil rights movement forward because not only of their past and their education, but their leadership capabilities and the fact that, that they were students. So they didn't have the same kinds of connections and responsibilities that older adults had. And they were very effective in helping to coordinate something around the country almost every week. And in fact, that's what John Lewis was involved in when he uh, was a student at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. And so Birmingham, interestingly, um, was a place where they were celebrating, ironically, the, the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And, but yet the segregation was so intense there. The police brutality under Bull Connor was so well known. The KKK was terrorizing people in that area that the SCLC said, we're going to select that city to target because it's such an important touchstone for what's happening throughout the rest of the South and in fact in many places in the country. Next slide. And so um, Martin Luther King Jr. was very much involved in helping to organize this. Next slide, please. And so he helped to coordinate this and he was, was Grant, he was right there on the ground with all the other officials and eventually was arrested. And there are a number of images. Let's go to the next slide <coughs> because I, I think it's important to see some of these images. Um, the image on the left is of the Birmingham, the, the church in, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, in which the four young girls were killed. And then of course, on the right, um, you have the pictures of the police who were using police dogs to attack men, women, and children, some of whom were actually kneeling uh, and praying in protest, and they would attack them and bite and, and harm them. They were also using uh, fire hoses on these individuals, uh, many of whom suffered um, bones that were broken, uh, contusions and so forth. This was the battleground and Bull Connor um, was someone who was the poster child for the worst kind of police chief and racist um, that was really needed to highlight these problems. And then, of course, George Wallace um, got up and, and made the statement, segregation now, segregation today, you know, segregation forever. So the, the people who were for segregation did everything to highlight to the world um, these issues. And it really helped to catapult King um, who was the organizer, he was one of the main organizers of these protests um, to highlight this. Um, it was designed to embarrass the country. It was designed to make the country see itself, to hold that mirror up so that we would stop hiding what was the case. Give you a real local example of that. In the 1940s, um, Vivian Carter Mason, who was the third president of the National Council of Negro Women, she and her husband um, uh, lived in Norfolk. Um, and she was a social worker by training. Um, and she was someone who helped to start uh, a local chapter of the Women's Interracial Council here in Norfolk. And she needed the women, because the idea was, let's get leaders, women who were married to all these male leaders in the area, and let's have these women come together, and maybe they can influence their husbands to help change policy. That was the idea behind the Women's Interracial Council. And Mason and the women, very well-educated women who were African-American, who were part of this organization, needed the white women, some of whom were highly educated, but they were all well-connected 
to see the realities of how some African Americans were living in the city. And what they showed them brought tears to these women's eyes because right in the middle of the city on property owned in some cases by their husbands in total violation of city code, some of these people were living in, in uh, apartments that had earthen floors. They didn't even have wooden floors. They were living literally on the ground with outhouses in the middle of the field. And these were city apartment buildings. And so they began to show them the world in which they lived in, but it was hidden from them because the city had restructured itself so that whites really didn't need to didn't have to go into the black sections, that the city almost created a barrier uh, between the black and the white sections. And that barrier still exists today. In fact, the one street that will lead you from the east side to the west side is currently closed in part of that street. And that is called Princess Anne Road that connects the two together. And it was and the, that little road was designed to be very narrow and difficult to maneuver because that would be the one road connecting the two sides together. So there was an effort to hide the reality uh, of, of, our, of segregation and discrimination from the majority of the white population so that they would not feel bad about these discriminatory policies. And so the efforts of the civil rights movement, the efforts of Martin Luther King Jr. and others was to really open that up so that people could really see and understand. Next slide, please. And so what did King do? His friends, because there were some really harsh policies. They wouldn't let um, him have a newspaper, have books, have pen and paper. And so some of his friends snuck this in and he began to write scribble uh, on the, in the margins of the newspaper what became the letter from the Birmingham jail. And he wasn't writing to the people who um, were clearly racist. He was writing to those who were the moderates those who were sitting on the fence, those who, who were comfortable about what was happening and blaming the people for their own victimization, um, that were pacifying uh, themselves to believe that they were doing all they could. He said that it was the moderates who were the, the obstructionists more than the white supremacist organizations. And he said that blacks are tired of waiting don't tell them to wait anymore. Don't tell them to be patient. They have been patient. And what that means is that if you continue to say, wait, 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 you're going to frustrate people and what will happen will be violence. Next slide. And th those ideas, by the way, are not new. In fact, in, in 1829, there was a free black um, by the name of David Walker who wrote a book called Walker's Appeal in which he said exactly the same thing. So what was happening in the 1950s at the time that King wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail, at the time that the activities were going on? Um, well, you know, I mentioned that there were uh, suburbs and the federal government uh, was helping to facilitate the white flight to the suburbs um, and locking black people into the inner cities in that uh, were now deprived of a lot of capital, um, locking African-Americans into areas where you were congregating poor people in, in large sections um, and, and basically locking them into these communities that were also um, in terms of environment, sometimes 10 degrees hotter than in these white communities. There was a high unemployment rate. Uh, the schools were poorly funded, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. And so tensions were building. And whenever that happens, you're going to usually have some violence. But to kind of stave that off, 
um, all of these civil rights organizations said, we're going to have this march, this massive march on Washington um, to let the world know, not just the government, but let the world know what was going on, the need for jobs, the need for equity across the board. And Martin Luther King Jr. was one of many people who made speeches that day. And he actually had intended on making a different speech than the one that he ended up making. And he was egged on by some of the people who were there on at the podium with him to tell the world about his dream, not just about the issues that are there, but about this dream that he had. So when you listen to his speech, part of it is very much uh, a written speech. It's a speech that comes from his journey as a civil rights advocate and what needs to be done. But then you hear at the latter part, this other speech, the speech that is inspiring, the speech that people are trying to misuse today, the speech that is aspirational. It is about the hope that he had for America, not the reality that existed, but the hope. And he's telling people, this is where we need to go. This is my dream, my hope. This is, these are the ideals that we say we're a part of in American society that we're really not trying to actualize. But this is the hope, not the reality. Next slide, please. And so when you, if you go back and listen or even read his speech, you really should hear those two parts of the speech. One is a written presentation where he's laying out the, the needs, the demands. The other part is the aspiration, the, the hope and the dream that is there. Next slide, please. But you know, that's not the beginning or end of Dr. King, because after the March on Washington, after um, uh, John F. Kennedy's assassination, which really helped Lyndon B. Johnson, who became president, to push um, the 1964 Civil Rights Act that banned uh, segregation in public spaces, uh, especially at the uh, um, uh, any federal level. So any interstate commerce that was involved, it banned that. And then after the 1965 Voting Rights Act was passed, there were still other issues at work. Johnson initiated his War on Poverty Initiative, <clears throat> excuse me, that then got sidelined by the Vietnam conflict. And so the all of the ideas and all of the funding that he had for the war on poverty were actually shortchanged as he put more resources into the Vietnam conflict. So the idea of welfare um, that was part of the war on poverty was stifled because there was there was education and job training and a process for helping people go from that job training to employment, to getting off of public assistance. That all got eliminated. And, and so then what we had left were, was just the basic structure of a program that would actually create or not create, but perpetuate cyclical poverty because much of that funding was redirected to the Vietnam War effort. And so King and other leaders saw that this was a problem and tried to address it. Um, and of course, uh, this is where also you would see a radicalization of the civil rights effort and a morphing into what we call the Black Power Movement. Next slide. And the people, of course, who embodied um, that movement were people such as Malcolm X and Kwame Torre, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, who had taken over as the leader 
of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And he actually put a lot of that aside and, and actually was an advocate for violent reaction in some cases. We would see um, a lot of the issues becoming um, real hot topic issues because there was an expectation for change and then no change. And whenever you raise expectations, you're always going to have a really negative pushback and feedback from that. And we would see that. We would see um, this, this war on crime begin even before Richard Nixon uh, campaigned on the idea that he was going to tamp down on crime. Um, and what you would actually see is a lot of... Um, a lot of involvement, like a secret program, the Comatel Pro, that the FBI started where they were putting drugs into some of these inner cities, of, of especially in northern areas, as a way of, of pr providing an excuse for the police and the federal agents to go in and tamp down on some of these radical organizations. So we would see so much chaos and confusion happening because there was tremendous fear that this anger and frustration among so many young people in the African-American community would somehow threaten the larger uh, community in America. And that actually resulted in a lot of uh, additional backlash. Next slide, please. And so Martin Luther King was looking at all of this and saying, we've got to have a new strategy for this new world we are in. And if we don't, we, we are going to suffer as a nation. And so he moved to Chicago because he saw that this was an effort that needed to be national, not just regional to the South, but it needed to be a national effort. Next slide, please. And in his, in his quest to find this new strategy, he latched on to two important things. One, that actually turned most of the African-American community against him. And the other um, was seen as something that a lot of people didn't want to talk about. And that, that the first thing is the Poor People's Campaign, um, which brought him to Memphis. Um, he, he needed the nation to really start looking at the income policy that they had that perpetuated poor people, even though they were part of the working poor. But he also said there were problems with Vietnam, that African-American men were disproportionately sent to Vietnam and disproportionately sent to the front lines in Vietnam. And this was wrong. And this really made him a pariah among many people, especially African-Americans who were seeking so much validation that they were supporters of this nation. So they didn't want to be seen as critical of especially uh, international policies. And so he was out there all alone in many cases um, because of his stance on the Vietnam conflict. Next slide, please. So when we think about King, um, you have to put all of this together. In addition, I didn't mention his personal life with all of the women that he was associated with, the, the, the um, uh, affairs that he had and so forth. Um, you know, this, this is all part of this man who was very complicated, but at the same time understood that every time he made a speech, he risked violence against himself and his family. And his family had been bombed a number of times. He had been, there had been a number of assassination attempts against him. And somehow, when, you, when you're reading a lot of his writings and the statements by a lot of the people who knew him uh, in 1967, 68, he knew that at some point in time, because he had seen so many of his friends like Medgar Evers killed, he knew he was next. He knew that his time was running out. And, and, and I want us to think about this. I'm 64 years old. He was 39 when he was killed, 39 years old. And so he had his whole life ahead of him, but somehow he knew that he didn't have a long time. And he actually said that 
a number of times to not only his friends, but also to the community when he spoke. Next slide, please. And so when he attacked the nation's policies on Vietnam, he became a pariah, not only to a number of his supporters, not only to a number of the blacks who were part of the leadership, like in the NAACP and the Urban League, but also to Johnson, who saw him as a direct threat, as well as Nixon. <coughs> Next slide, please. And we know that in 1968, he was in Memphis, Tennessee, attending um, the Poor People's Campaign. And that's when um, at, the, uh, ho at the motel, uh, the Lorraine Motel, he was shot and killed. And what's interesting is that when, within days after his assassination, Congress did pass this um, uh, additional 1968 Civil Rights Act. And from uh, almost shortly after his assassination, from that point on, his widow began to advocate that we have a national day of celebration and commemoration on his legacy because she saw his legacy as, as the legacy of all African Americans who were fighting for civil rights in American society. Next slide. And so I wanted to end by really having us um, know and hear one of the statements that he made in his letter from a Birmingham jail that I think is appropriate even today. He said, I'm cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere in this country. I thank you for your time. I hope that my, my little lesson in history has provoked some thought and hopefully given you um, a, a different understanding of the man that we honor for Martin Luther King Day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Newby Alexander. We have been truly honored to have you present to us today regarding the legacy, the words and deeds of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You have been inspiring and informative and we are truly grateful for you taking your time to present to us. Thank you to all of you in our district and all of our guests in other districts for your participation here today. We hope you found this to be inspiring and thought provoking. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the in the chat, so I'll get to those. Do you know why the funding for those programs was never put back into the welfare program? Um, in part because once you remove funding and you redirect it to other things such as defense, it just stays there unless there is a real effort to put it back. And um, a lot of time went by. Um, I mean, you think about it, it was 1975 when we finally pulled out. Uh, so you're talking about 10 years of redirected funding. It's just not going to go back, not unless there's an effort in Congress to re-energize. And in fact, uh, during that period, the focus was not on welfare. Um, in fact, um, when Ronald Reagan came in in 1980 as president, he focused on this idea of the welf welfare queen, someone exploiting the system and used a black woman to symbolize that. And so he actually wanted to cut the program and then used the lack of funding and the lack of achieving those goals 
that could not have been achieved because the funding wasn't there as a reason to cut the funding even more. Mm. Um, thank you. And one other question, what, what can we do to honor Dr. King's legacy? You know, I'm going to give the, the line that Frederick Douglass did when um, before he died, um, a black reporter came to him uh, and this was in 1895. And he said, you know, all the things that you worked hard to create, um, you know, you, you, you have to be upset by what's happening now. And what advice do you give? And his advice was agitate, agitate, agitate. And I just kind of want to substitute a word in there. Educate, educate, educate. Learn for yourself. The worst thing that you can do is simply listen to someone else tell you what you should know. People guide you to more knowledge. And I think that the more the more information you have, the more able you are to be a well-rounded individual. Um, and so that you can better assess what between fact and fiction, you can better assess when someone takes a part of the truth and skews it to their point of view. Um, historians really despise that. We, we love to hear all the different sides and to balance out things. Um, and, and that's why historians have often been, been demonized and, and called ultra liberal because we're looking at all the facts and we're saying, well, but the facts are lining up here. You know, what are you talking about? Um, and and we, we tend not to get embroiled in a lot of political uh, dialogue because it's, it's not about truth telling, it's about opinion making and persuasion. Um, historians like for their students and the general public to know and to understand. So I encourage everyone, get a book, especially those they want to ban, get those books begin to read and understand that there are no heroes and villains per se, uh, because no one actually lives up to all the ideals that they have, but you, you balance it out by saying, what were they trying to do and what did they accomplish, even with all their flaws and with all their shortcomings? And what, what can you assess from that? Um, that's important for you to understand because it's it's about also understanding our society and culture. And so I would encourage people, educate yourself, get those different books and articles uh, about those individuals written not by politicians, but by historians, not by politicists, but, in, but historians. Get that information and assess it yourself so that you are well-armed, well-educated, and well-grounded. All right, well, that wraps up season three, episode one of Core Talk, Agile and Educated. Make sure to follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Go to our Core Talk playlist on, on our YouTube channel. We're also on your socials. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. All those links will be in our show notes below. So for this episode, we'd like to thank some folks who helped make this possible. Colonel Brian Hallberg, Tom Emmerich, Matt Ferguson, Dr. Newby Alexander, Anna Myers, Sharika Williams, Jay Walker, and as always, my boss, with so much patience, Mark Havilland. All right, until next time, this is Core Talk.